Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to another episode of Condo Insider. Uh, my name is Jane Sugimura, and I'm going to be your host for today's episode. And you know, this is uh, part of a uh, uh, continuing series that you know I've decided to do this year because it's an election year, and um, we're I'm I'm interviewing candidates uh, who are running for elected office, and mainly candidates who have lots of condos in their district because. You know, uh, as a condo owner or someone who works in a condo, you would want a friend in the legislature because they're the ones who pass the laws that you grumble and gripe about. To me, at least that, uh, you know, that's what I've been hearing, you know, about. And so, so it's really important for you to get to know your candidates. And today I, I have as my uh, very special guest, Representative Adrian Tan, who is the representative the the, uh, the sitting representative of uh, in the House uh, of Representatives for the Waikiki Alamoana area. I think it was District Twenty Two, isn't it, a Adrian? Yes, um, I represent District Twenty Two currently. Uh, after reapportionment, it will be District Twenty Four. Okay, and so you're the the current representative for that area, right? Correct. Okay, and so uh, tell us about your background. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Adrian Tam. I was born and raised here in Hawaii. I'm the proud son of immigrants and I'm a proud graduate of our public schools. I had the opportunity to go to Penn State University. Um, and in case anyone was wondering, the public school is Kalani because we all know how important public where you went to high school is here. Um, and after college, I decided to come back home to you know work for my, mom, my family's small business and um, take care of my grandmother and just wanted to be back home where I um, um, was born and raised and grew up with. Um, I became a licensed realtor with my family business and I wasn't getting enough clients uh, who was going to trust a fresh out of college um, guy with their biggest financial decision, right? So I took a part-time job at the legislature as a session hire under Speaker Emeritus Calvin Say. And I immediately fell in love with the legislative process and community service. I then worked on the campaign for Senator Stanley Chang and ultimately got him elected to the Hawaii State Senate. And I joined his office as his office manager. In 2020, I decided to run for office myself because I felt that, you know, the voices of the people of Hawaii needed a new perspective. So I ran for office and I proudly won. And now I currently represent one of the most beautiful districts in the world or most places in the most beautiful places in the world, Waikiki, Alamoana, and soon to be more Ili Ili and Macaulay. Okay, so you're running for re-election, right? In this election? Yes, I am. And so can, can you give uh, our listeners some, some of the reasons why you're running for re-election? You know, I, when I ran for uh, my first term, I didn't do it the conventional way. I challenged an incumbent and, you know, I ran on the idea of, you know, these new problems will need new solutions and that requires new leadership. And I still believe that today, right now. And that's why I'm running for re-election is because, you know, it takes some time I believe to really work on a lot of these issues. I believe that I've gotten the conversation started on a lot of the issues that I care about, which is an economic diversification, um, kupuna issues, keiki issues, education. And now, especially in our district, condominiums. I happen to live in a condo right now. So I understand a lot of the issues that many of my constituents care about. And I think that's very important in an elected official that. Um, is representing a district that is so heavy with condos. Right, and you do have a lot of condos in your area, what you said, Waikiki, the Alamoana area, Mo'ili'ili. So there's yep. lots of condos there. And the challenge for, you know, uh, somebody running for office is getting access to the people who live in condos, okay. right? I mean, that, that, that's, that's the challenge. And, and, you know, so hopefully, you know, uh, this show will get your message uh, to you know condo dwellers, especially in this area, because you know we 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 I I particularly 
think it's very important uh, because I've been uh, you know, advocating for condominiums in the legislature, God, for almost 40 years. And, you know, and so I, 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 I really believe that, you know, condo owners, you have to be best friends. And in my district, I made best friends with my, my representative, my senator, my city council person. And so when I call their office and they know who I am, and I, I freely tell people in my building or people I meet, you know, in, and if they have a problem, I say, oh, you have a problem in this area? This is who you call. You call your, 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 your city council person, and that person is, is this, and I give them the name. Is go on the website. When you go on the city council website, find your council member, and your contact, the contact information is there. They want, they're there to help you. That's their job. And the same with a state issue. If it's a state issue, here's the representative, here's the, the senator. And I've, I've learned that, that, you know, that the, the most important word is, hello, I'm a constituent and I vote and I have a problem. And, and I'm so glad when I, uh, on the other side, they say, okay, tell us what your problem is. And they, you know, maybe they don't fix it, but they sure, you know, I get the impression that they're there to help me. And I think, you know, that's what you and your colleagues do. You, you, you right, your office answers questions practically all day long from people who live in your district. And you have a lot of condos. And um, let me just go over some of the issues that you know, seem to, to come up. And uh, like one of the issues is fair housing and reasonable accommodation. Yes, and yes. there are two issues. And one of them is emotional support animals. And that cuts both ways because there are some, some buildings that are no pet buildings because their bylaws have indicated that you know, the owners have voted and they said, you know, we don't want pets. But you know, emotional support animals are not considered pets. Uh, so uh, under the fair housing uh, statute. So, I mean, have you had any, any uh, experience dealing with, you know, these uh, requests regarding the emotional support animals? I've never had any um, experience dealing with that. Actually, um, the closest thing that I have experienced it with is um, my grandmother herself. She has an emotional support animal. Um, it is actually our family dog too. Um, mm -hmm. His name is Winston. Um, but this past legislative session, we did pass SB 2002, which mm -hmm. clarifies a lot of the uh, misunderstandings or the conflicts between what defines an emotional support animal and who can um, provide paper, uh, papers on what it, who needs an emotional support animal. I think now it is a healthcare worker, a mental health professional and or a social worker that can do that now under that new law. Oh, uh, well, it's potentially a new law, only if the governor signs it into um, as an act. Right. And, you know, with emotional support animals, I mean, uh, there are, uh, there are, I mean, all of us know what service animals are. And yes. we know that, we, and, and we, we, there's no issue that service animals are allowed in condominiums and nobody uh, disagrees that a person who is disabled and needs a service animal to assist them, you know, should be allowed to have them. The controversy, I think, with emotional support animals and comfort animals is that uh, some people think that this is, you know, just a scam, you know, they, they're not really, you know, uh, providing any type of service, but, you know, somehow they've been able to uh, you know, some people are allowed to have these emotional support animals, but yeah, this yeah. is this is beyond state law. It's federal law, isn't it? The, the it fair is. house. It's fair house, and it's discrimination. Yeah. Yes. And, and and basically, the licensed professionals who who have to sign the letters have to say that they are treating. In fact, that's what one of one of the uh, points of this new new um, legislation, uh, uh, Senate Bill two thousand. Uh, 2002 says that the licensed professional who signs the letter that goes to the board for a reasonable accommodation needs to say that the per they are treating the owner. Under fair housing, I guess the, the way it works is uh, if you know if you have a if you need an emotional support animal uh, to uh, to uh, treat a symptom of a disability. 
and the and and the the, the condominium doesn't want to know and doesn't need to know what that disability is. But a licensed professional, whether it's a medical professional or a social worker or some has to be a licensed professional, has to write a letter saying that the uh, person who's requesting the reasonable accommodation and the reasonable accommodation is usually because that building has a no pets law or no pets rule, a bylaw you know, rule. Sure. And, um, and so you have to, so under fair housing, uh, the owner is re, re, or the resident is allowed to make a request to the board of directors of the association for reasonable accommodation under fair housing, which is a federal law. And failure to do so is discrimination. And then you end up with the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission. But anyway, um, uh, you know, so, so the concern was that, you know, people were going on the internet and talking to somebody in New Jersey and, and the boards were getting these letters from people on the East Coast, from North, you know, from all over the mainland saying, you know, uh, I'm a licensed professional and this person has a disability and you should let them have uh, a service animal, I mean, uh, uh, an emotional support animal. And we were told we had to accept them, but there was a lot of grumbling. And so, you know, part of this Senate bill uh, 2002 says that the person who writes the letter has to be actually treating that person. And so I think, uh, although it's not a win for the people, you know, who are grumbling about the emotional support animals, I think it, it allows, you know, it allows um, boards to at least, you know, question if you get something like from a letter from somebody in New Jersey yeah. and, and the letter doesn't say that they are treating the person who is asking for the reasonable accommodation, you can then ask, well, you know, we have a law in Hawaii that says, you know, if you, if you want, you know, you want the reasonable accommodation, why don't you go see a doctor or a licensed professional here in Hawaii and, and bring us a letter? Yeah. And, you know, when we talk about mental health or uh, emotional support like that, it really walks on water because you don't want to be discriminating against anyone um, and be filed with a lawsuit, which can be very costly. Right. And that's why we passed this law to make sure that, you know, boards can question where they come from and um, redefine where um, these letters may come from, that it has to be someone um, that is being treated with, that is someone treating that individual with uh, their mental health. And it has to be a healthcare worker, a mental health worker, or a social worker. Okay. And another area of discrimination and reasonable accommodation is med medical marijuana. And, uh, and there have been, you know, lots of people who have um, I applied for the, I applied to the Department of Health, right, for that card. Yes. Uh, to, to use medical marijuana. And, you know, and that's been a challenge for the legislature because, you know, then you know, you're dealing with uh, whether or not it's consistent, you know, with rules in a building. Um, let's say a, a, a building allows smoking, right, in the common areas. Mm -hmm. And so you can't really then tell somebody who has got a marijuana car <laughs> that they can't smoke in, in, in a common area because you allow, uh, you know, regular people to smoke or vape in a common area. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, that's another area that is, has proved to be a challenge to the legislators because it seems like periodically we get changes to the medical marijuana law. And I think just recently, maybe last year, there was a law passed about um, uh, a medical, that they could not, that, the, that uh, there could be no regulation uh, or prohibition of use of the me um, medical marijuana if there was a, a smoking allowed. Yeah, the biggest complaint that, um, our office myself get um, from our condominium owners on medical marijuana is the odor that lingers around and oftentimes travels into other people's units. Um, we, when it comes to reasonable accommodations, it's always about trying to make sure that the person has the ability to practice um, with, uh, and, you know, use their medical marijuana without, you know, passing laws that would hinder them in any way. Um, and, 
One thing that the legislature has done, and I sat on the task force for this, which was we basically allowed medical marijuana industries to start um, developing and selling edible cannabis as of January 1st, 2021. Um, edible cannabis is actually much um, healthier than inhaling hot air into your lungs. It's proven much more effective when dealing with health um, um, conditions such as sleep apnea. And it doesn't have that odor that comes with the smoke when you're smoking marijuana. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's one thing that the legislature has done to provide some kind of reasonable accommodation to those that are that have the um, medical marijuana card. Okay, and you know, there's an, another issue that seems that popped up this session in the legislature, and that's e, uh, electric vehicle charging stations in yes. multifamily buildings. And, um, and I think it was well intentioned because the legislature for years have been working on laws to limit, uh, uh, you know, uh, the use of uh, coal and petroleum and, um, and to, to, to use energy efficient uh, technologies. And so, but you know, what, 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 what this bill addressed or tried to do was to say that all condominiums or all multifamily buildings, which are condominiums, um, need to uh, develop plans for putting charging stations in each parking stall. Yeah. That was the bill, that was the way the bill read when it was originally introduced. And uh, we got involved, my organization, Hawaii Council got involved, and we basically said, you know. For one thing, it's impractical. I mean, you yeah. we have 300 stalls. You can't put a charging station in each stall. That's expensive. You know how, in fact, any type of retrofitting is terribly expensive. And so when you bring up, when you try to do retrofitting in, a, in, in an existing condominium, uh, I think, you know, along with passing a law, you've got to provide some incentives or some funding or tax credits or something because this is going to cost the building a ton of money. And especially with, you know, with, with putting charging stations in each of the parts, I, I don't think they understand. First of all, the electric connection that goes into the parking garage only supports the use of maybe a few lights and some electrical equipment. And mm -hmm. you think about putting 300 charging stations in a parking structure, how many wires and you know, lines you're going to have, and and you're just not going to have, you know, a uh, 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 electrical source that's large enough to service that. Either that, or it's going to be super expensive. Yeah, um, I remember that law. I remember hearing that law, asking a lot of questions because you know it didn't define what an outlet was going to be either. Could it be an outlet that you can just charge your iPhone in at each stall, or is it something much bigger that it's enough to charge a car? And there's also the idea of fairness too. Um, so let's say a condominium has the electricity built into their maintenance fees. That everyone's maintenance fees are gonna go up to accommodate those driving electric vehicles and charging them, um, even though they may not be driving an electrical vehicle. You know, So those are the questions that um, I raised and it was definitely a very difficult bill to, you know, pass through even though we didn't even we didn't pass it though um, because we do want to meet our clean energy goals and we do want to be more environmentally friendly and we do know that electric vehicles are the future and that one day you know gas powered vehicles are going to be phased out right but you know and the, mm -hmm. the issue is the, the issue would be retrofitting and and one thing i that i brought up you know at one of the hearings was that <clears throat> right now you have technology that allows one charging station to service more than one vehicle. Mm -hmm. And they can charge in, uh, one, so they can fully charge a vehicle in less than an hour. So if that's saying that, then that's a technology that exists today. And today you don't, in, in a condominium of, of maybe 100, 100 units, I doubt if you've got more than 20 electric vehicles in that building, right? Mm -hmm. So installing an electric 
vehicle charger in every stall is overkill. Yes. And in a condominium, in order to do that, you're basically assessing everybody in the building, even though they don't have an electric vehicle, which doesn't, isn't fair. Yeah. Right? It isn't fair because, you know, like, you know, my, I have a gas powered car and I think a lot of you would do. Um, does kind of, does that mean we put, you know, gasoline pump stations in every single condominium in every stall? No. Um, I think that the best way we can move this forward is to make sure that there are enough charging stations out there that are conveniently located um, across the island so that anyone who needs to charge their vehicle can do that. And, you know, the, the, and, and, and I brought up at one of the hearings too, Hawaiian Electric. In fact, when I, the, the, when I was testifying, Hawaiian Electric had a, uh, had a um, request before the PUC to install 75 free charging stations Mm -hmm. across the state, 44 of them would have been in Oahu, right? And, but yeah. they were doing that across. And so, you know, here they are, they're putting in free charging stations. Plus you have technology that's evolving and God knows what it's going to be 10 years from now. Maybe, you know, you'll, you'll just have, you know, a remote that you can use to, to charge an electric vehicle. Yeah. You don't know what the technology is. And so for, to tell uh, a, a condominium, or a co-op, you got a plan now, you got to come up with a plan and we want to see the plan on how you're going to remotely, how you're going to charge all these vehicles that you don't even have. I mean, that's kind of stupid. <laughs> you're absolutely right, especially with older condominiums as well too. Yeah, and you know you know what, I, I, I was talking to um, one uh, association representative and I never thought about this, but I, I, I know that it happened. She says, you got to watch where you put your, your station, because if you put your charging station in a part of the condominium, common elements, like let's say visitor parking. Yeah. And there's no gate. The condominiums across the street, they see your charging station. Guess what? They're going to come in and they're going to use your charging station. So what's to stop them from using your charging station? Exactly. Yep. Yeah, so that means you've got to put it in a secure place so that only people in your condominium or, or the residents in your condominium can use it, right? So it has to be in a secure, you can't put it in the guest parking because guest parking is usually out there in the public area where anybody can drive in from off the street. They see your charging station. They say, oh, wow, look, there's a charging station. And they go and they hook up. Yep. And there's no possible way to determine who, which car whether that car is a car that belongs in, to a condominium owner or not. Right. And I never thought about that. But then I, I know that when we do bulky item pickup, I live in a loop and there are six condominiums. And, you know, when, when, we, put, we, and when we put our stuff on the sidewalk, it's like a disease. I mean, you can come back in two hours and there's all this stuff. And we, 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 in fact, my condominium was, was talking, our board was talking about putting up cameras. Saying, where does this stuff come from? It's the people across the street. They see the stuff on the sidewalk. And guess what? They bring their stuff down and they put it there. And no, we don't know, you know, we know it's not ours. But, you know, if, it, if the bulky item people don't come and pick it up, our, our uh, maintenance people have to move it into our garage, right, until they come. And that's not fair because, and if we leave it out there, we're going to get fined by the city. Yep. And so I, I know, you know, I know about, you know, if you do it and the neighbors see it, they're going to come and use it. And so I, I was, I, you know, I was really, you know, uh, kind of surprised, you know, that when, when they brought that up. But there was another bill that you guys passed, the omnibus, con the condominium bill, House Bill 2272. Yes. Um, that was a good job that you guys did passing that bill. Yeah, uh, it really puts us in line with like, you know, new technology, especially with the, um, with the remote owners meeting and electronic voting. Yeah. And, you know, I think we needed that because, I mean, last year they passed a bill which allowed for um, remote hearings uh, uh, for the uh, associations and electronic voting but that was only in the case of an emergency. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's why, you know, we, we went to the 
legislature and others brought up certain things that you know hey what if you what if it's not an emergency and we want to have uh, remote meetings because we kind of like the remote meetings because that means that people who are you know are uh, investor owners who live on the mainland or who live on a neighbor island they can you know join by zoom or you know go to meeting or whatever you know platform uh, is available they can you know join the owners meeting because it's allowed to be done remotely Mm -hmm. And so uh, this bill basically leaves it up to the owners. The owners, uh, you know, can uh, 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 designate their board or, or delegate the authority to the board to do remote uh, meetings. And and if that if that's the case, then the board can decide they're going to have owners meetings remotely. They can already do board of directors meetings remotely. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just more convenient, especially um, now that we know with the new technology um, that people can do it. Um, I understand that there were some issues regarding electronic voting that, you know, someone could be pressured to vote a certain way or someone could take the code to vote for that individual and um, vote on behalf of that individual. But I think that we worked it out by establishing a lot of the you know, um, safeguards into the bill. Okay, well, you know, we're kind of running out of time. So yeah. I just want to bring up one, one more issue. There was a leasehold bill that was introduced yes. and it didn't get a hearing. But, you know, we're, 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 I, I'm hearing that, you know, there are some buildings who, you know, are kind of concerned about this. There are leasehold buildings in Waikiki. You've got Yon Arbor Tower, Discovery Bay, uh, Wailana, the Canterbury. And, mm -hmm. you know, and they, you know, they're not fee simple. Uh, they yeah, want yeah. And so what, what is this bill that, that you uh, introduced? What would it do? This bill will basically exempt the seller fee owner from paying the uh, Hawaii State capital gains tax of 8% on any lease fee interest um, transfer to the leasee. So, so and, and basically when they sell, because of it's been so long, yeah. Uh, that the that the family that the property has been in their family, that the capital gains tax can be huge, millions of dollars. Yeah. And so this eight percent savings is a is a big benefit to the sellers and an incentive for them to sell to the lessees. Mm -hmm. Yes. And is there a, a plan if you're reelected to, to reintroduce this next year? Yes, I plan on reintroducing it again and again and again until it is passed because it is a very important bill, especially for those that are currently coming up on their leases ending okay well thank you so much i mean we, we have gone over time but i'm so glad that you were able to join me on this episode of condo insider and for our listeners out there uh please join us uh uh next week and i'm going to have another uh candidate uh for you to um uh, an another candidate to interview and to tell you why they're running for election and i hope you join us for that uh episode uh, Mahalo and uh, aloha. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.